Hello and welcome back to Random Librarians on YouTube and again I know I said this recently but whatever the heck my bangs are deciding to do I have no idea it's driving me up a wall. I've got like a whole part here that I have to like force hairs over to cover it and I don't it, I don't know how to bangs which is a problem because I have them and I like them when they're behaving. Hmm. Well, that's not what this video is about, though. So today we are talking about more book mail, and uh, ugh, I think it is from ooh, <laughs> uh, the American Library Association Midwinter Conference that happened in January, which was online. They have a thing called Swagapalooza, which is normally like the place where publishers will set up their arc tables and just kind of like hand them out like like candy. And it is the best thing in the entire world. Um, but of course, we couldn't really do that in the current time. So they had Swagapalooza online, which is just like filling out a lot of forms and like giving people your address. <laughs> but as a result, I'm pretty sure most of these are from the ALA. If I somehow ended up on like a bookstagrammers list for other people, that would be great as well. But uh, thank you to all of the publishers who sent me these books. And um, let's just jump right into it. So this first one, I covered another book in this series that Penguin is putting out in my last book haul, book unwrapping, book presentation kind of video. And that is the Penguin Vitae or Vitae. It's been a really long time since I took Latin and my teacher wasn't all that great. And this is supposed to be the classic books that you would place together on a shelf to represent the course of your life. So that is the idea behind the hardback series that they're doing here. So this is East Goes West by Young Il King, which I believe is um, a classic. Ooh, I love, I love endnotes. This is so fun. Okay. So there's a lot of endnotes. There's an afterword. Um, suggestions for further reading. Let's see. The novel in your hands is the first detail in fiction, the experiences of a Korean American in America by the first Korean American novelist, Young Hill King. Originally published in 1937, East Goes West would later inspire the Filipino American Carlos Bulosan's novel, America is in the Heart, published 28 years later. I feel like my classics education is very remiss in not having put this on any kind of list for any classes that I've taken or any like best of American fiction that I've seen. So I'm really interested to read this and learn more about the early Asian American experience. So that is that book. The collection is stunning. And yeah, thank you, Penguin. I think it's a new branch of like Penguin Classics is who's publishing that. So in this one is from Celadon Books. It's called The Plot by Jean Hanf Korlitz. And this sounds so good. So this one is going to be publishing in May of 2021. I always get excited when May comes around because my birthday's in May. I don't know when the, what day it's published. I keep trying to find books that are published on May 2nd so that I can just like, you know, make that my book because that is the date of my birth. Anyways, so this is about a once promising novelist who has decided instead, or been forced to instead, teach writing at a MFA program. He's at a third rate MFA program, sorry. And hasn't written or published anything that he sees as decent in years. One of his students brags about having like the plot, like the perfect plot, the uh, the book that is going to launch his career. So the student says it's a sure thing and the teacher hears the plot and he's like, ah, oh, damn it, I'm about to be so eclipsed by this young, like hotshot, thinks he's got it all kind of student. And he waits and he waits and the book never comes out and he knows the plot. And it turns out the student, I think, has passed, has died. So the teacher steals the plot and publishes the book. And then gets a note 
saying, you are a thief. So there's this whole confusion about like who actually came up with the, the plot for this book. Was his late student murdered? What's going on? Who's stalking this best-selling, this now best-selling author with a story that they're not the one who came up with it? So, I mean, doesn't that sound great? Next up, we have Ariadne by Jennifer Saint, which came with a little sticker, which is always fun. I don't think it's... Okay, well, it looks like the cover, if it didn't focus. Uh, this is also for May. I, and it's by Flat Iron, published by Flatiron Books. I love all of these retellings that are coming out of Greek mythology. I know that Circe has a bit of a love it or hate it kind of thing. I listened to it on audiobook and it was just like such a nice thing to walk to and from work listening to because it was like the voice was very like meditative uh the voice of the reader um the story is like familiar enough that it felt like going back to like stories that I loved as a child but never placed front and center and like all of her story all of the parts of a uh, story that she's in involved in kind of pushed together like that so I really liked it Ariadne is the princess of Crete who gives the ball of string, ball of enchanted string to Theseus to kill the Minotaur, right? I think that's who she is. And I'm really excited to be reminded of who she is exactly. After that, we have just quite a mix of books. So we have Letter to a Young Physician, Notes from a Medical Life by Suzanne Coven which is a poignant, funny, personal exploration of authenticity in work and life by a woman doctor. And I don't really know much about women in the field of medicine. I shadowed a couple of doctors when I was in high school and uh, it didn't end up, you know, trying to become a doctor, but it is something that really interests me, especially because it can really vary whether you're a female doctor or a doctor of color or someone who is practicing who's not from the US but is practicing medicine in the US. I feel like there's a lot there's a wide variety of experiences to be had within one field and it's a field that is that can be very intense that involves life and death. So I'm really excited to read this. I uh, love a good memoir. So this is great and it's going to be published by ww w. norton and company in may as well next up we have a stunning cover it is the unsettled ground by claire fuller i in this color it's gonna grab my attention also flowers very pretty this is gonna be on sale may 18th this is my favorite way with they mark the arcs it makes it so much easier to know when to tell people about it, when to promote it, all that kind of good stuff. And it is a W.W. Norton again, but their subsidiary, which is Tin House. I do wish that they wouldn't put these um, vote for library read stickers on them because they're just labels. So they're really hard to get off, which makes the bookstagram pictures very hard. But that's, you know, such a weird first world problem. I don't even know what to do with it. So this is a termed a brilliant novel about an unusual family held together by a string of lies, a small town with too many questions, and a sudden death that threatens to undo them all. So that's fun. So we have 51 year old twins who are still living with their mother in the isolation of the English countryside. So we have this family of three isolated in a little hut, or cottage, sorry, <laughs> and the outside world is modernizing, but they are still remaining kind of as they were in their childhood. And to the, it says to the outside world, it seems like poverty, but to them, it feels like home. And then when their mother dies, they have to kind of figure out what to do because their cottage gets taken back by their landlord. They need to find work? Do they stay faithful to 
like their childhood and the way they grew up and each other or do they instead go off into the modern world and discover things but then all of these secrets from their mother's past and their town and the bat I don't know how they fit this much in this few pages so yeah that's a one to keep an eye out for Next up, we have My Friend Natalia by Lauren Lindstead, which is in translation. And it's being published by Liberite, which I don't think I know, but it's a division of W.W. W. Norton and Company. And this is, this book was originally written and published in Finland. So that's fun. The author is compared to Anais Nin. This is already kind of giving me um, Adele by Leila Slimani vibes, just based on the first section. So it's narrated by an unnamed, ungendered therapist of a woman who is uh, obsessed with sex. So I'm taking that to mean that she is uh, kind of in the same category of women that we don't really hear about when it comes to sex addiction. We normally hear about like the men who get caught and it's like not really seen as a bad thing even though it's an addiction whereas like the women who struggle with it are kind of never in the media <laughs> so that's always interesting but this is actually someone who's going to therapy so I hope that the therapist is not the evil one in the book <laughs> so we have philosophy and literature a repressed childhood repressed childhood memories oof uh-oh the sessions quickly shed all inhibitions. No, no, don't cross the line, therapists. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I still have a lot of questions based on just reading the back. Ooh, I saw something in handwriting. That's always fun. Just saw the word vulva while flipping through the pages. So that's. Ooh, yes, this. Got some handwriting pages. Interesting. I mean, I'm definitely hooked. I need to know exactly what's going on in this book because I don't think I have much of a understanding from the back. Um, a friend of mine who picked this up was like, that sounds amazing. So maybe for people who typically read this kind of fiction more frequently than I do, it might make more, um, more of a like full picture, but I, I need to read it, I think, to see all of the puzzle pieces come together. And I hope that it is stunning. There we go. So thank you to W.W. W. Norton again. Uh, the next one is one that I am so excited for because I'd actually just seen a proof of this on bookstagram and I was like oh my god I need that book and then it showed up in my house and I was like I, I this is with wish fulfillment at the, the highest level and I'm so pleased so it is the personal librarian by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray and this is based on a true story of Belle da Costa Green, who was J.P. Morgan's personal librarian, and she was one of these, like, titans of class and society in that era of New York City. So she is a secret and she has to protect it at all costs because she has this much sway and this much power and this much influence over a sphere of extremely high-class, high-moneyed New Yorkers. The secret that she has is that she is not uh, of Portuguese heritage, which is how she's been explaining her darker complexion. Instead, she is African American. So we have this woman who is famous for her intellect, style, and wit, and ha this book shares the lengths that she has to go to protect her family, preserve her carefully crafted white identity in the racist world in which she lives. So yeah, I think this one is going to grapple with a lot of questions, but also, ugh, gosh, I just, I, I don't know. I, I don't fully know how to put into words exactly how amazing I think this is going to be because I haven't read it yet and I don't know what it's going to be grappling with, but anytime you put a librarian on the cover, you give me historical setting. 
I'm gonna want to read it. So <laughs> here we go. Biggest thank you to Berkeley for sending this my way. It is coming out on the 1st of June. 6-1. That's 1st of June. Yes? Yes? Next up, we have Just One Look by Lindsay Cameron with a quote from Caroline Kepnes on the front. And it's giving me kind of you vibes, you know? This is from Ballantine Books and it's going to be out in July. And the, the like thing that will catch you here is that eyes aren't the window to the soul, emails are. So, so our main character is working at thankless temp job at a law firm reviewing correspondence uh, for a large-scale fraud suit. So it kind of goes the, the route, I think it's attachments by Rainbow Rowell or something along those lines, but instead of being like cute and fluffy, it is a woman who is kind of, she's lost a lot and this isn't really the job that she wants to be in, but she becomes a little bit obsessed with the interactions and the emails between one of the partners and his wife and she thinks that they're you know the most loving most wonderful just most everything couple and she becomes a bit obsessed and starts mimicking them in real life and then she orchestrates a chance meeting with the husband and suddenly wants to take the wife's place If thrillers are your jam, there you go. Next up, we have The First Day of Spring by Nancy Tucker, which is uh, from Riverhead Books. This is also just an incredibly beautiful book. On the back, there are quotes from Ashley Audrain, the author of The Push, and Stephanie Robel, author of Darling Rose Gold. So I think we are going in another kind of thriller direction with this one. It's going to be on sale May 18th. We have Chrissy at the beginning. She's eight and she has a secret. She just killed a boy. So, and, and she's very happy about that fact. It says it made her belly fizz like soda pop. That is an eight-year-old's uh, killer. An eight-year-old's who wants to wield some very intense and uh, dangerous power. And then she grows up and 20 years later, she is living in hiding under a different name, trying to forget all of that, um, that. And then the past is trying to catch up with her, threatening to take away the one thing she cares about, her five-year-old daughter, Molly. Oh gosh. Apparently this story is told with a shocking authenticity that moves one from sympathy to to humor, to horror, to heartbreak, and back again. So, emotions. Let's have them. Pretty book. Oh boy. Chrissy and Molly are gonna mess me up, aren't they? Next up, we have Whisper Down the Lane, a novel by Clay McLeod Chapman. This one is going to be out in April and it's from Cork Books and they are very good at publishing books that kind of uh, walk the line in interesting ways. <laughs> so this is about the satanic panic of the 1980s. The way that the back is written is kind of confusing to me because I can't tell if we're like bouncing forward from the past to the present um, or if the two characters mentioned on the back are supposed to be one person in the same way in, uh, that in the first day of spring we have a mother who has an assumed name now. We have Richard who doesn't have a past but who is an art teacher at his stepson's school in Virginia and there's a rabbit that is ritualistically murdered and it appears on the school grounds with a birthday card for Richard and it says Richard doesn't have a birthday but Sean does dot 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 Sean is a five-year-old boy who has just moved to Greenfield Virginia with his mother 
like most of the boys in the 1980s, like most of the mothers in the 1980s, she's worried about Bill's childcare putting food on the table and an encroaching threat to American life that can take the face of anyone, a politician, a friendly neighbor, or even a teacher. When Sean's school sends a letter to parents revealing that Sean's favorite teacher is under investigation, a white lie from Sean lights a fire that engulfs the entire nation and Sean and his mother are left holding the match. Now, 30 years later, someone is here to remind Richard that they remember what Sean did. And though Sean doesn't exist anymore, someone needs to pay the price for his lies. So I'm pretty sure that Richard and Sean are the same person. I don't know why that was so confusing to me the first time I read it, but yeah. I mean, the story of like the historic real happenings of the Satanic Panic and this is the Mar McMartin preschool trials of the Satanic Panic in the 1980s. Those are bonkers. Uh, there's a whole bunch of really interesting podcasts that have been filmed, recorded, uh, whatever you used to say for podcasts, uh, delving into how it started, how it became such this moment of panic, really, and how many lives were ruined as a result. So I think it should definitely be interesting to delve into it again in a fictional sense and see if I can't figure out who's who and what's going on. So we do have different types of storytelling in here. I saw some back and forth what looks like interview um, transcripts as well as more traditional book writing. And then throughout the book there are these just black pages, which makes for like a cool side look at the pages, but seems like it just uses a lot of ink. So, fans of true crime and uh, the 1980s, check this one out. Whisper Down the Lane. Like I said, it's going to be out in April. This next one is a chunky, chunky book, and it is a Polish translation. It was likened to Game of Thrones when I attended a book buzz that included this. It's going to be published by Forge in April. It's called The Widow Queen by Elisbieta. Elisbieta. Chozinska. Hope I didn't butcher that. And this is, I think, based in the real history of Poland. It follows uh, Swietoslawa. Swietoslawa? Swietoslawa's family. She is the daughter of a great duke. He has three daughters, so he wants to kind of marry them off and form alliances that way, but our main character decides that, uh, in fact, she doesn't want to get married off. She wants to be a duchess, or sit on a throne, at least, in Poland. And then there's all this, you know, political intrigue, backstabbing, all that good stuff. And that she will learn that the crown sits heavy and power is a sword that cuts both ways. The Widow Queen is a story of royalty and betrayal of star-crossed lovers and exiled kings and of motherhood and womanhood in a world and time ruled by men. There we go. On the back it says Wolf Hall meets Vikings in this epic historical saga that imagines the until now untold story of a 10th century princess who went on to rule two kingdoms and change the landscape of Europe forever. So yes, and like I said, it is a thick one. Uh, it is just about 500 pages. And I don't know, it feels heavier than that, but I'll take their word for it. So for anyone who's interested in historic, like dark royalty kind of vibes, I feel like this would be right up your alley. And yeah, I think they're definitely trying to go for Game of Thrones vibes. I mean, that is a dark cover with the throne front and center. Ta-da! Okay, three left. <laughs> I feel like this video has been going on for quite a bit of time. 
So we have next Saving Grace, which is a novel of suspense coming out March 16th by Debbie Rabbit. This is by uh, published by Scarlet, which is an imprint of Pensler, which is distributed by Debbie Debbie and Horton. There's a lot going on here. We are, our setting is a rural town in Arkansas. Our main character who we follow from childhood to an adulthood when she is the sheriff, the first female sheriff of her rural town, has had a lot of stuff happen to her. She was orphaned at 11. She was forced to move in with a Bible salesman uncle wheelchair-bound aunt and a cruel cousin. Then she has a bully at school who makes her life a nightmare. She has one friend who makes everything a little bit more bearable and then that friend and another of their classmates goes missing. Then fast forward to the, the future when she is the first female sheriff which already kind of causes some waves of discontent in her community. We have someone return to town and another sixth grader goes missing then a white supremacist cult shows up to bring its gospel of hate to repentance and violence explodes. We got a lot of people missing, we got other people dead. There is a lot going on. She has a sixth grade daughter, so she has to also worry about someone kidnapping her daughter. So yeah, I think I'm gonna really just again, go to what it says in the back here, and it is at once a spellbinding tale of innocence lost and a twisty edge of your seat psycholo psychological thrill ride. And apparently this is a debut and there's just a lot going on here. Wow. Okay. I have some friends who really love thrillers and I definitely think I'm going to have to pass this their way once I've given it a look-see. Saving Grace. There we go. Next up, we have Hold Fast, which has a burning ship on the front, and it's by J.H. Uh, Jell... Jellert... Jellenter. Sorry, sir? Ma'am? Person? Uh, this cover just makes me think of, if you've seen The Drunk History with Lin-Manuel Miranda, and he says about how, like, you can't really have... Hamilton arriving on a, a flaming ship, which is what how he really arrived to Boston. Um, and he finishes that with, uh, you know, and your ass will never be the same. And that's all that's coming to my mind right now with this cover. But it's really cool, just like objectively speaking. This is another one that has come to me from Norton, which is very kind of them. It is out in May as well. We have a desperate sea battle, a fortune wrist on the turn of a card, a duel at dawn with the loser. Patrick O'Brien meets James Bond. It is 1803. We have British Secret Service, belligerent France under Napoleon. <laughs> Ooh. We have Thomas Gray, who resigns from British intelligence and departs England for Boston. Hey, I love it when things are set in Boston. But his plan to start a new life is thrown abruptly off course when a French intelligence network attempts to recruit him as an informer and exposes a grave new threat to Britain that Grey can't ignore. Dun dun dun. Okay, so yeah, we've got a historical James Bond, and I don't know if he's supposed to be British or American at the end of all of this, but uh, should should be interesting. Also, our, our main character is a grief-stricken widower, so if that is something that will trigger you, don't read this, but I hope we've got some swashbuckling fun based on the cover as well. Just a lot, wow, okay, okay, ta-da, hold fast. And finally, we have Great Circle, a novel by Maggie Shipstead, which is just very pretty, look at that. Now, this is a historical novel focusing on two women who are very different, but also both sound like complete badasses. We have a daredevil aviator and a disgraced Hollywood starlet. And uh, yeah, apparently their fates collide across geographies and centuries. So uh, this should be fun. This one is coming out again in May and it is a chunky chunky book. Let's see how, how long it is. 589 pages. This one is almost 600 pages and 
it's very pretty. Uh, didn't tell me too much about the two main characters, but it's historic. Hopefully it'll fill the, uh, I think it's a hole left by, um, Avalyn Hugo, but like, you know, hopefully this could be in that same genre so people will love it just as much as they loved Evelyn Hugo. I think that's what I'm gonna hope for this book because why not? <laughs> Alrighty, so that is my latest bout of book mail. Thank you again to all of the publishers for sending all of these books my way. I am so excited to dive in and figure out which ones are going to be new favorites that I should force all of you to love as well. <laughs> if you have a thought about which one I should read first or any other kind of ideas uh, following this kind of chaotic <laughs> walkthrough of this stack of books, please don't hesitate to leave a comment, um, like it, subscribe, YouTube stuff, and uh, yeah. Go read a book. Bye. <laughs>